Good afternoon. Welcome to the uh, first session after lunch on uh, LCA 2010. We'd like to uh, welcome uh, Ted Cho from Google, who's going to introduce to us uh, making production ready file systems, a case study using X4. Can you please make him welcome? <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, so today, what I really plan to be talking about is not really about ext4 per se. Um, I'm not going to talk about the features of ext4 really. Uh, I'm really more going to be talking about failures and bugs uh, and how we try to get rid of those so that we can actually make a file system become production ready. Uh, because I think very often people sometimes have... Uh, a very optimistic view about how long it takes to take, get a file system to a production-ready status. Uh, and a lot of that is based on how quickly we can sometimes get other pieces of code into production-ready status. And I want to talk about why it's a little different with file systems. Um, so the first thing I thought I might do is, uh, since it's right after lunch and, you know, want to make sure people aren't, you know, going to fall asleep because, you know, we've just all eaten. Uh, is I thought I would actually, you know, do a little bit of audience participation. Um, so what do you all think are things that might make it hard to make a function or a library or some application uh, hard to test? Um, sorry? Timing is one. Yeah, users are reluctant to test it for you. What else? Breaks the machine when it fails. In front? Only use it in edge cases. Way in back. Requires, uh, hard to acquire resources like giant files. Okay, hard, hard to acquire uh, resources like giant files. But more generally, things have to get up. Yeah, uh, uh, more generally, hard to have an environment that's uh, hard to test or have conditions. Yeah? It doesn't run in user space. Well, that's for file systems. I'm saying functions or libraries, but you're all thinking in the right way. Yeah, way in back. Ah, so it fails in subtle ways that you only notice a week later. You guys are coming up with great ones. One last one. Yeah, funny hardware bugs. Um, so I actually had three here. Um, you guys actually had a lot more, but it's a lot of the similar ones. Uh, you know, there's the old saying, premature optimization is the root of all evil. Um, one of the things that uh, is, you know, one of these tips that you will sometimes hear is that if you want to design a class or a function to be easy to test, uh, try to avoid internal state as much as possible, or at least localize your state into one function, because as soon as you have internal state, in order to actually test, you are not only testing the input parameters, you also have to test the state variables inside the, the, the function. Um, and of course, parallelism is really hard to test. I mean, if you need threads, that's great, but single-thread programs are much, much easier um, to debug. So that's for programs. So what makes a file system hard to make robust? Funny thing, it's largely the same thing. Uh, people want file systems to be fast, uh, and it needs to be fast for many, many, many different workloads. Uh, and that's, that, that can be really tough. Uh, another problem is uh, the entire job of a file system is to store state. That is what it is trying to do. Uh, and that makes it very hard in particular because when a user reports a bug, I usually don't have access to the state of the file system because it's a 100 gigabyte disk, if I'm lucky. It might be a terabyte disk. Uh, and I don't have access to that state. So reproducing the bug can be very, very difficult. Uh, and then the third one is file systems inherently have a huge amount of file, uh, parallelism, in particular if it's a general purpose file system where you have lots of processes and they might be all banging on the file system uh, at the same time. And this is some of the things that make file systems really, really hard. Um, so I w started and I had this great idea that I would you know, compare file systems to fine wine. Uh, and there's a very, very famous commercial uh, done by Orson Welles uh, uh, for Paul Masson Winery. We will sell no wine before it's time. 
Uh, and then after I did this slide, I realized two things, that many of you in this room may not have actually heard of this commercial for two reasons. Uh, number one, this commercial campaign happened in the late 70s. Uh, and number two, Paul Masson is a U.S. winery, and there are plenty of really, really good wineries in Australia and New Zealand, and why the heck would you buy a California wine? Um, so I thought I would actually de um, show you this particular uh, video clip just for fun. It took Beethoven four years to write that symphony. Some things can't be rushed. Good music and good wine. Paul Masson's Emerald Dry. A delicious white wine. Paul Masson wines taste so good because they're made with such care. What Paul Masson himself said nearly a century ago is still true today. We will sell no wine before it's time. So that's kind of cool. Um, and the main reason I want to say that is that as a file system progresses, there is one of the things which you just simply can't get away from, which is, like fine wine, a file system has to age. Now, it's at this point that I actually have to add a caveat, just because I do like to drink wine, which is most wine aren't fine wines. And in fact, letting them age probably not a good idea because most wines aren't made to be aged these days, particularly crap wine that gets advertised on television. Um, so <laughs> most wine, you know, you probably want to drink it within six months of buying it unless it's like a really expensive bottle. But for a good file system, you really do need to let it age. And the reason why you need to let it age um, is because that's how the bugs get found, right? And there's this really hard problem uh, that file system developers have, which is, especially if you're ethical, um, which is you're not going to find the bugs, or you will do the best job that you can to find all the bugs that, that you can possibly find. But then if you're at all realistic, you know that there are going to be all sorts of issues that you won't find, but other people will find. So on the one hand, you want to encourage people to actually use your file system. On the other hand, you don't want to be the cause of their losing data. Uh, and how do you actually manage that line? And, and that's, that's, that's a really hard problem. The other thing is I think people always underestimate how much time it takes and how much engineering time it takes to make a file system. Uh, and I think a lot of that is because of the fact that we have to do all the bug fixing, but we also have to do performance tuning and all the rest. Um, about uh, at this point, almost three years ago, uh, I and a, uh, uh, a group of other people got together um, to try to uh, help BTRFS get more corporate funding. Um, so we actually had some senior technologists from companies like HP and IBM and Oracle and Intel, and we all got together and we said, yeah, you know, we really need a new file system. Uh, you know, XD3 is a good file system as it goes, but it has all these limits. EXT4 will only take us so far, but its main goal is to you know, get something that we can make production ready sooner rather than taking a, a long, long time. Um, and one of the questions that we sort of came up with was, well, in order for this thing to work, it's going to take a huge amount of resources, and everybody needs to chip in because otherwise it won't happen. Uh, and as part of that exercise, I actually went and I talked to people who had done file systems before um, for other enterprise systems. You know, so like OSF1, we had some people from HP who were part of the Compaq OSF1 team. Uh, people had done file systems for other commercial Unix systems. And the answer that you always got back was between 75 and 100 person years, engineer years, worth of effort to actually make a data center quality file system. Um, one person actually told me 200 PY. Um, that's a huge amount of effort. Right, um, and you know the other problem is, of course, do you actually tell the corporate execs that? Because if you tell them that, then they'll be all scared and they'll run away and they won't do anything. And we we finally said, well, every company should donate two engineers, um, and we we thought that would be enough. Unfortunately, not all the companies actually followed through with our recommendation because this minor thing called the financial bubble hit. But you know what can you do? Um, but just to prove to you that in fact these are the kind of numbers that it takes. Um, let's meet the ZFS team. 
Uh, this is actually a picture that I took from uh, Sun's uh, ZFS slide deck, and I sort of blew it up, and, and uh, you can see around a dozen people in that picture. Uh, I talked to Val Henson, who was actually on the ZFS team for a while, and I don't have exact numbers, but we do know that Sun started working on ZFS in 2001. Uh, they announced it in 2005. They actually shipped it in Solaris 10 in 2006. And it's only been in the last year or so that the sysadmins that I've talked to really were confident that they would put their really critical data on ZFS, right? And that, that just sort of shows you, number one, you know, Sun probably put close to 100 engineering years of effort between when they first started doing it and now. And it's only recently that, you know, sysadmins would really put their most critical data on it. Now, of course, some people uh, were, in fact, experimenting with it, you know, with less critical data before that. Uh, I heard one brave person actually put their mail spool on um, all of their uh, bar mail on it, and then when it locked up, had to back out. But, you know, that's sort of par for the course. So it just takes a lot of effort. And, you know, here's another picture of, of some of the ZFS engineers. Um, and so where are we with EXT4? Uh, so this is actually sort of an interesting time. Uh, EXT4 was renamed from EXT4Dev to EXT4 uh, just a little over a year ago. Uh, 2628 shipped on Christmas Day, 2008. Um, the patch that actually renamed EXT4 to EXT4 went in during the merge window. Uh, so in early October, we actually pushed the patch to Lena saying, Okay, we're going to call it ext4. Uh, at this point, it's shipping in community distros. Uh, first showed up in Fedora 11 by default. Um, before that, in Fedora 9 and Fedora 10, uh, you had to enter some magic undocumented boot string to the installer if you wanted to use ext4. I think it was something like, I acknowledge ext4 may eat my data or something like that. Um, and so we had some guinea pigs. Uh, Fedora 11 was the first release where it was actually um, released by default as the default uh, uh, file system. Uh, Ubuntu 9.04 had ext4 ha as an option. Uh, 9.10, they started using it as the default. I don't have the exact dates for OpenSUSE, but I know OpenSUSE is, that, as, is at this point uh, shipping ext4. Uh, in RHEL 5 and SLES 11, ext4 was shipped as a technology preview. Um, I can't speak to what the enterprise distros will do with ext4 in their next release, but you know I'm hoping that RHEL 6 will in fact be shipping ext4. Um, and if all goes well, we'll start seeing adoption in data centers 12, 18 months later. Right? There's this thing. It's much like you know the whole stereotypical thing where. All the penguins line up, and they're looking to see who will jump into the water first and you know, whether they get eaten um, by a hungry elephant seal. And if one jumps in and no one gets eaten, then they all jump in. And there's a similar effect that actually happens. right? Everyone says, yeah, we're going to wait for SB1. And really what's happening is they want somebody else to find the interesting bugs first. Um, and so this is where we are with the XT4. Um, and uh, one of the things that I did just as an exercise was uh, since 2628 was the first kernel that we actually called it ext4 instead of ext4 dev. Uh, the first bar is all the changes that went in between 2628 and 2629. Uh, and then 2630, 2631, 2632, and this is as of approximately 2633 uh, RC3. So it's not all of 2633. Um, and blue is bug fix, orange is cleanup, uh, yellow is feature, uh, and green are uh, performance fixes. Uh, and these are a somewhat loose characterization. You know, I may have been off by one or two where, you know, something, is it a bug fix, is it a performance fix? Um, but, you know, it, it's good enough to get you a fairly good characterization of where things are at. Uh, and one of the things you might first ask is, wait a moment, what's going on with the bug fixes? Um, if we're stabilizing, why isn't the bug count you know, going down? Uh, and one of the reasons is because over time, we've actually been getting more users of ext4, and so we're finding more bugs. Right? And 
Fortunately, most of the bugs have tended not to be data corruptors. They tend to be ones uh, where they lock up the system. Um, but certainly early on, uh, there were one or two howlers that, in fact, really did lose data. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about those in a moment. But you know, this is just the data as it goes today. Um, if we were to take a look at the bug fixes and we try to break it down, there's actually a huge amount, which is just simply miscellaneous. Um, the blue is denial of service. So what these are are if you deliberately corrupt the file system or the fi you get bad luck and the file system gets corrupted in a certain way, uh, and this could be due to hardware error or due to someone deliberately engineering uh, a corrupted file system image, um, it, the, the file system might actually hang or it might oops or otherwise crash the system. Uh, and depending on who you talk to, uh, there were some people who actually thought these were security bugs. Uh, and the argument was, well, you could put a carefully corrupted file system image on a USB stick, and then you could stick the USB stick into your laptop or your desktop. Um, most distros will try to auto-mount the USB stick uh, and then crash. Um, and there were you know, some people who actually would you know, file, you know, get cert CVE numbers uh, for, for these things as vulnerabilities. And, you know, my attitude was, it's a bug, we should fix it because I want a robust file system. But, you know, if I can get close enough to stick in a USB stick, I can probably hit the reset button. So, you know, whatever. There are bugs, we want to fix them. Uh, the orange area is uh, race conditions, uh, uh, usually leading to deadlocks. Uh, sometimes the races were very, very hard to hit. Uh, other cases, the races were ones that we found due to a kernel subsystem called LockDep, uh, which is a lock dependency meter thing that will actually automatically show that you take locks in uh, one order in one part of the code and in another order in another part of the code, and that's a potential deadlock. Uh, it may or may not ever actually happen in real life, um, but we sort of treat them as lint warnings, which is to say, if LockDep detects a problem, we try to fix it, so we take the locks in the right order avoid the problem altogether. Yellow are F-sync or sync bugs. Uh, these are bugs which only show up if the system crashes and we don't guarantee the consistency that we're supposed to get. In many cases, um, these bugs are completely harmless as long as you unmount the file system cleanly. Um, and as we'll see in a moment, one of these bugs we found was an ext3. Um, and, uh, you know, it was also an EXT3, and so it's been around for years. No one ever noticed. Um, and then the final area is leaks. Typically, these are bugs and error paths where, you know, error paths are code that's not very well exercised, and we forgot to free a buffer head or forgot to free some sort of kernel resource, um, and so we would leak a bit of memory uh, in an error path. And then those were sort of the leak bugs. Um, Okay, where were the bug fixes? Uh, and this is more by sort of the area of ext4. Uh, early on, we had a huge number of problems between the new allocator, um, which was code that was donated to us um, from the Luster folks, the cluster file system folks, the, who later got bought by Sun, um, by, uh, Sun Microsystems, and the online resize code. Uh, and part of the problem was this was just simply code that wasn't well exercised. Um, people generally didn't do a whole lot of online resizes. Um, apparently, the Lustre client, uh, customers just didn't do that. Uh, and so there were holes, um, primarily locking holes, uh, that would sometimes deadlock the machine uh, if you happened to be allocating files while you did an online resize. Uh, and these were, these were ones that, I, like, like I said, we found fairly early in the process, so you know, shortly after 2.6.28. Um, another set of problems is uh, races in uh, the pre-allocator, and what do you do if the file system runs out of space? Um, one of the problems, and this is a problem that is true for all file systems, it's actually a hard problem for file systems in general, is if you want to get good performance, one of the things that you try to do is you put off trying to decide where on disk block should go until the very last minute. Um, because at the very last minute, we know how big the file is, uh, and so we have a better idea about where to put it on disk. More importantly, 
for certain benchmarks and for certain workloads, it may very well be that it's a temporary file that we will actually end up deleting. Uh, and if you don't actually pre-allocate it, you put off the work, and as any good procrastinator knows, sometimes when you put off work, it gets overtaken by events and you don't have to do it at all. Um, uh, a benchmark that people really seem to like is dbench. Uh, if you read the read file, dbench will actually tell you that it is a very, very lousy benchmark. Um, and one of the things that I remember Tridge telling me years ago is that if you actually tune things right with dbench, the hard drive light should never go on. <laughs> Funny thing if it's a file system benchmark. Um, so, you know, my other preferred term for dbench is random number generator. Um, it's just that it very accurately models, uh, at the time, very Im uh, commercially important web benchmark, and so it's sort of assumed outside proportions. Um, but it's a really good example of why pre-allocation pre is a big win. So, why did I go into all of this? Well, if you're going to pre-allocate and you may run out of disk space, um, handling what happens when you run out of disk space is hard. Um, for a long time, uh, BTRFS had the caveat, you know, Chris Mason would, you know, come up, give up his presentation on BTRFS and say, no, I haven't fixed the bug where we panic if you run out of disk space, right? This was the panic on Eno space, and it was sort of a famous BTRFS shortcoming. Uh, it was actually finally fixed. I think it was fixed uh, late summer last year, maybe fall of last year. Certainly by September it was fixed. Um, so they actually fixed that, but it just simply goes to show this is an area, again, early on, 2628, uh, 2629 era, we had a whole bunch of issues here. Uh, online defrag. Uh, and one of the problems with online defrag is very few people were testing it. And because very few people were testing it, um, and in retrospect, I probably should have been a lot harder on the review, uh, there were bugs there. In fact, we're still occasionally finding bugs in online defrag. Uh, most embarrassingly, uh, about two months ago, we found a security bug where if you use online defrag in the wrong way, a non-privileged user could overwrite a root-owned file, like, say, Etsy password. Um, oops. That was our, you know, first security, what I considered real security bug in ext4. We got it pushed out to all the distros pretty quick. Um, but again, it go, just goes to show, if you've got code that doesn't, isn't, necessarily exercised a lot, and online defrag f fell in that category, uh, that's where you might have problems. Uh, FIMAP. Uh, this is code that is an ioctal. Um, the ioctal happens to be called uh, FIMAP uh, for extent map. Uh, file information extent map, I think, is, is the uh, expansion, uh, where you give it a file descriptor and a logical block number, and it will give you the physical block mapping of the extent uh, in that range of logical block numbers. Uh, it's used by the program FileFrag and not much else. I think, uh, and the problem is, again, because it's not used by a whole lot of programs, um, there were bugs that we just simply didn't find for a while. Uh, a related problem was it was one of those uh, interfaces, like online defrag, that wasn't exercised by any of our automated test suites. Uh, and that's also uh, an issue. Uh, quota, uh, again, very few people use quota. Certainly very few file system developers use quota. Um, and so we had holes there. Uh, no journal mode. Uh, no journal mode was code that was uh, contributed by Google. Uh, uh, and that was because they wanted to use all of the features of ext4 from a performance point of view, like delayed allocation, but they didn't want the overhead of the journal. Um, from their perspective, because of how their systems were set up, uh, the overhead of the journal wasn't worth speeding up the amount of time that it took to FSK the drive uh, if the system crashed. They had other replication systems for it. Uh, they contributed the code for it. Um, and again, because it wasn't a mode that was commonly used by the rest of the community, um, and because there were all sorts of assumptions that had crept into ext3 over the years, that assume the presence of the journal, uh, there were various subtle bugs that showed up only if you use no journal mode. Of course, the Google people were the ones that were finding it themselves, and they sort of sent me the patches, and I you know, reviewed them and then put them in. 
Um, so those, those were the bug fixes. So does anyone want to guess what some of the new features were that went in in the last year? Right, that yellow um, patches, which were new features. Do these look familiar? There's a huge overlap between this list and the previous list. Uh, and it just simply goes to show, which is you get the bugs where you have the new features. And this is why release engineers have to be real ogres when you say, please, 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 can I slip that new feature in? Because the reality is any new feature will have bugs. The good news is most of these bugs, in particular things like the online defrag, you know, aside from the security hole or FIMAP or you no know, journal code, were in code paths that most of the rest of the world weren't actually using a whole lot. Um, which is good because it means, you know, it made me feel better when I looked at that. I realized, okay, even though we were fixing a whole bunch of bugs in 2631, 2632, they tended to be bugs in, for example, the no journal mode code, which wasn't one that would actually hit a whole lot of people. Um, and again, you know, that, that always is sort of a good sign. So let me very quickly roll through some example bugs that we found, just so you can get a flavor of some of the things that you might have hiding in your file system. Uh, this first one uh, was fixed in 2.6.30, so it was fixed quite a while ago. Um, and this is one that took us literally over six months to find. Um, very shortly after I pushed the patch to Linus, saying, okay, I think we're good. I've been using this for about you know, six months on my laptop. I haven't lost any data. I think it's good. I think it's solid. All right, let's rename it. And very shortly thereafter, even before 2628 started coming out, about once a month or so, some early adopter, and there was one early adopter in particular, would show up and say, yeah, I have this bug where um, you know, I'm doing something, and on reboot, FSCK has failed, and my inode table or my group descriptor blocks are totally trashed. Um, and when it was group descriptor blocks, usually we could actually recover the data after some huge, horrible manual operation. Um, but this was very worrying. Um, and it only, for this one guy, which I have to give him a lot of credit because he stuck with us for six months, and on average, once a month, he would actually lose data this way. Um, right? And he was using it intensively the rest of the time. It was just this one thing, and we couldn't figure out for the heck of us where it was. Uh, and the answer was we had a race, uh, and I'm about to violate uh, some slide presentation rule because I've put more than two words on the slide in a major way. Um, uh, but this is actually the commit message. Uh, and uh, a lot of words. The short version is that uh, we had a single cache for the last extent that had been used, uh, and we didn't have a lock protecting it. Uh, and if you had two processes that were writing the same file at the same time, um, they could collide and you would get unlucky on a multi-CPU system uh, and you would end up trashing um, some, uh, some block that was very early, usually less than block 200, uh, and that would usually crap out some bl uh, block descriptor. Uh, and it turned out the reason why, well, I'm getting a little bit ahead of my story, um, so, you know, the first thing we might ask ourselves is how in the world did this actually slip by? Uh, and this was actually, the code in question was actually part of a code donation from the cluster FS folks, and they had been using it in production for years. No, nope, that wasn't the problem. The problem was that, uh, um, and the other problem was it was a large code donation, and we just missed it on the code review. The reason why they didn't see the problem was because Lustre uses the file system as an object store, which means they had a single thread reading and writing files. And it turns out this is the common case, right? I'm a developer, so how do I edit files? Using Emacs, right? Or maybe use VI. And then when I compile a program, you know, CC writes an object file. And the thing is, those are all single threaded writes. The person who was having the problem was using Samba and doing backups. And it was only backups, so he wasn't actually losing really precious data. Turns out, Samba, because of Windows, will write files in parallel, multiple threads writing to the same file. And that would screw it up, right? But it, you know, this goes, just simply goes to show, just because the file system developer hasn't had any problem for months and months and months, 
doesn't mean that the code is safe. Um, and as I, uh, as I just said, you know, turns out most file system writes in general, unless you actually have carefully written code that is trying to go fast, like a Sama server, is single-threaded. Um, so I never noticed the problem either. Now, fortunately, this is an example of the only way you find these problems is you push the code out into the real world. Fortunately, the guy who was willing to stick with us was someone who was doing backups. And he was willing, because it was a new backup machine, to, you know, deal with the, you know, loss, because he knew, well, it was only backups, and he was willing to live with that. Uh, and if it weren't for him, it would have been a lot harder to find the problem. Uh, but that's just, you know, one example. Uh, here's another one. Uh, we had a race between uh, write metadata buffer and get write meta buffer, and the details aren't really important. Um, what's important is that the wrong data could be written into the journal. Uh, and this sounds really, really uh, serious, um, but as the rest of the commit log says, you only notice the problem if you crash before you've written another commit. If you write another commit, then there's no problem. And this is an example of a bug that was in ext3 as well. Right? So this is a bug that ext3 has had for years. It turns out you have to be really unlucky, um, and you have to like lose the race condition and corrupt the journal and then crash. And if that doesn't happen, you won't notice the problem. Right? And it just simply goes to show you can have a perfectly good file system that you think is stable, and it can have bugs like this hiding in it. Uh, this was another one which uh, <clears throat> was in code that was used by uh, the fibmap function, which is another file frag um, problem, uh, where basically we would get a bogus, bogus bug check, um, and you would just simply get a crash. And the main thing here was this was code that was very rarely executed because very few people was actually using an old version, if you were using ext4, you tended to use the new version of FileFrag, which would use the new IOCTL, FIMAP. FIBMAP was the old interface that was used by old versions of FileFrag. And it turns out that if you were, you know, very early on, if you were someone who was an aggressive early adopter of ext4, you generally tended to be an aggressive early adopter of e2fs progs too because you needed that to actually check ext4 file systems. And it was only when, uh, I think this is one of the ones that was actually caught by an early Fedora uh, tester, um, they actually used the new kernel but had an old FS progs, uh, and it blew up, right? But again, it just sort of goes, sometimes these bugs are of the darndest cases. Um, here are three uh, performance fixes that we found. One was we just simply took an on, uh, unnecessary spin lock uh, in a POSIX Aquifex. This is actually one that uh, Linus, Linus found. Uh, not, not a whole lot I'll say about it other than people really care about performance because there are certain bits of the file system which really are in the middle of critical code section that's used everywhere. Um, and so, uh, you know, p the, the, the optimizations really matter and the optimizations are what cause you to actually get into trouble with uh, bug fixing. Uh, this is another one which sort of slipped by us for a very, very long time. And the problem here was that in order to make delayed allocation work, we had to reserve space on disk um, for where we thought the blocks would actually end up on disk. And we weren't releasing them after we had finished pre-allocating the file and after the file had been closed. And it wasn't really a big deal, except that it make, made the on-disk format uh, we, we would mean that files would tend, the free space on the file system would tend to get fragmented, um, which you won't notice until you've been using the file system for a long time, and then you notice, gee, why is the file system getting a little fragmented? Um, and it's because we weren't releasing pre-allocation blocks at the right time. Um, but again, it's one of these problems which, you know, the system is functionally fine, it's just a long-term performance problem. It takes a while before you find that sort of thing. Uh, and this is another nasty one. It just sort of uh, demonstrates uh, a problem that you can have uh, when you're interacting with other parts of the system. Uh, Linux's write-back code um, is really, really busted right now. Uh, it has a whole lot of problems, and I think one of the interesting questions is who's going to go and try and fix it. Uh, and so 
This is actually a workaround that XFS has as well, which is uh, the write-back code will not try to write back uh, in chunks any bigger than 1024 blocks at a time. And it turns out that if you're on a fast disk, you really want to write out bigger chunks than that. Um, and so we actually have this really ugly kludge that I can only justify because other file systems are doing the exact same thing, which is the write-back code will ask us to write out uh, 1024 blocks, and we'll basically say, oh, you asked for 1024. Well, I know better. I'll actually write out eight times as much as you asked. <laughs> um, and it's really ugly, but it's, it's sort of an example of sometimes when we're dealing with performance issues, we actually have to deal with the rest of the file system, uh, the rest of the, uh, the kernel. Uh, and one of the things that's going to be a little bit scary about the write-back code, which is I think one of the reasons why no one has touched it in a while, is there are these ugly workarounds that people have done all over the place to work around the fact that no one wants to touch the write-back code, so we just simply hack it in our own local file system. And so if anyone actually fixes the write-back code, we're going to have to run around and take out all these ugly hacks that we put into each individual file system. So it's all a bad deal. Hopefully we'll get fixed at some point soon. Um, but just to give you an idea of some of the things that we actually you know, have to deal with. So in conclusion, there is this basic idea that's out here, which is that file systems are easy, right? After all, there are over 66 of them in the kernel sources. Uh, that's what I counted uh, last night. Um, and in the kernel, we actually have all of this really cool generic support code. Uh, so that if you want to write a really, really simple file system so that you can pull your data off of your, you know, Amiga DOS file uh, floppies, it's actually really easy. You know, in some cases, all you actually have to do is provide the block map function, just add water, and you can actually have a file system uh, pretty quickly. Um, and so people think file systems are easy, right? Now, in fact, file systems are hard. Uh, and they're hard because general purpose file systems really have to work on a large number of workloads. Users want high performance, which means we're going to be doing the extreme things to get the performance. Uh, and that's where you actually get the bugs. And then you have lots of processes that are going to be hitting it uh, at the same time. Uh, so as an end result, making a general purpose file system really takes a lot more time uh, than you might expect. And for many people, the people who do it, uh, do it as a labor of love. Uh, one of the things that's actually really hard is justifying why you should do a new file system um, from a business perspective, right? If you're a corporate executive who's doing budgeting, uh, sometimes can be really, really difficult. Um, I'm fortunate that, you know, my employer actually seems to care about it, and I seem to, I can understand the business justification for why um, file systems are important to my employer. But there are many other companies for which it just simply doesn't make sense to do cool file system work. Uh, and that's probably one of the reasons why if you take a look at most commercial file systems that are out there, like say Veritas, dead in the water. You know, what are any new features that have gone into file systems in AIX or HPUX or any of the other legacy Unix systems? you don't really see a whole lot. Sun is the counterexample. They have ZFS. But think about that one. They have poured probably something like 100 engineering years of investment into ZFS. And it's not obvious to me, right, if you think about how much an engineer costs, um, which is any, anywhere from $100,000 US to a quarter of a million dollars US for one engineer, right, multiply that by 100 whether they've really gotten a return on investment that, would, that a Sun shareholder would actually accept for all of that investment that they poured into ZFS. Now, as an engineer, there are many reasons why you may do things that have, may have nothing to do with business justifications, right? And maybe that has something to do with, you know, why Sun is actually getting bought out. But, you know, the bottom line is, <laughs> you know, file systems are one of those things that you really do because you want to do it, not because... Uh, you know, uh, a lot of people just think it's sort of cool and fun and you can, you know, make money fast. Uh, so with that, I think I have time for a few questions. Uh, so uh, thank you very much.
We have five minutes left for questions. Please wait for the microphone so the streaming users can hear you. Um, as a budding early adopter, I'm <laughs> obviously scared of losing my data, just like you suggested, but I want to help the developers of the file system I have in mind. What is it that I can actually do? Uh, at the end of the day, you have to uh, trust the file system developers to some extent, and the only answer I can give is do lots of backups. Right? I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, the way you can help out is by trying out our code. Uh, if I'm going to be ethical with you, I can tell you, here are the ways in which I have tested the code. Right? I'm, I've been using ext4 continuously since about uh, July 1st of 2008. And I've never personally lost any data on ext4. Other users have. Right? But if you match my workload, you're actually probably pretty safe. Uh, now, the good news is these days we, we have regression test suites that we use and other things. And at this point, I'm actually pretty confident. So are most of the other community distros, or they wouldn't be installing it by default. Um, but the bottom line is, in general, you should be doing backups anyway. Um, and, but the best thing you can do is test code and you know, please do it safely. So one of the recent trends with uh, ZFS particularly, but we're also seeing it with ButterFS, is file systems essentially replacing half the VFS, the RAID, all that stuff. What's, how is that going to happen in a sane way that doesn't essentially mean rewriting the VFS, the RAID, all those things that spent 10 years making work fast and reliably? Um, so there are file systems that are basically subsuming some of the uh, uses of RAID, uh, that generally doesn't actually touch the VFS. What it does touch is the LVM, right? And so what is happening is, uh, to some extent, uh, for example, with BTRFS, they've had to subsume uh, some functionality that would have otherwise been done in, in the LVM, uh, which does introduce the possibility for more bugs. Uh, there's no real getting around that. Um, I think for BTRFS, and I don't want to speak for Chris Mason, um, but having heard him talk on that subject, uh, his solution to that problem is he's only solving a very restricted case of what you can do with LVM. So he's basically only doing uh, the equivalent of uh, RAID 1 and RAID 5. And if you want anything else exotic, you still have to use LVM. Um, but, you know, and then the answer is because he's doing other stuff, he had to basically uh, do different things anyway. So there are a lot of performance characteristics on the um, on spinning drives which don't really apply to uh, solid state drives. Where's Linux going uh, in terms of optimizing for solid state drives? So most of the time, if you are uh, assuming that the solid state drive is going to have its own flash translation layer, um, all you really have to do is turn off certain optimizations. Uh, and that's actually not a hard thing to do. Uh, so in most of the times, it's, it's essentially we've, we've done some careful work to make things work well for hard drives. They usually don't do any harm, but they don't do any good on solid state drives. Now, there are also people who are interested in uh, using flash devices without the benefit of the flash translation layer and having that work be subsumed into the file system as well. I'm a, a little bit dubious about that because that means the file system needs to know all sorts of low-level details about Flash, and I don't think the Flash technology is fully matured, so what's true today may not be true two years from now. Uh, so I'm not entirely convinced that's a good way to go, but I think some people will be experimenting with that, so I think we'll see. So do we have time for one more question, or do we need to end things? Uh, we unfortunately need to wrap it up okay. now. All right. So on, on behalf of LCA 2010, I'd like to thank um, Ted for coming in and presenting today, and we're going to give him a bottle of this uh, wine, which is somehow called Fiasco Wine. <laughs> thank you. Oh, one other thing. Uh, if you go onto YouTube to find that video, 
Also do a search for Orson Welles outtakes, uh, and you will see some very entertaining um, clips of him being somewhat deep in the bottle doing some of these commercials. So. Uh, <laughs>